Erickson and the Holographic Theory. Okay, continuing on a subject we looked at several times, is experience stored in the brain? Fourth in this series, or in other words, is the brain a suitcase which we carry experience around in to include words and concepts? For we'll be looking at storing words and storing concepts and the sad, bad current state of knowledge. And particularly to researchers Pepperell and Itzardi's admission in a, well, very recent impress mainstream journal. So is experience stored in the brain? Answer, nope. We've discussed this subject several times. These three, for example, specifically on the problems of storing experience in the brain. And this set on how memory actually works. Read integration, explicit memory, the whole problem of understanding language, etc. And even a journal article, a two or three. Here's one. I put it all together. It is experience story in the brain, a current model of memory in the temporal metaphysic of Bergson. And this is starting with the fact that experience is not occurring solely within the brain. And thus it cannot be solely stored there, as we've discussed several times. In the Bergsonian framework, the brain is, in effect, a reconstructive way specific to an event external in the field. And that event, the coffee stirring there and the buzzing fly, is not within the brain. So given the experiences in the brain, how do you store it there? This, sort of, this begins the whole problem. This, of course, is far from the view of mainstream science. But there are some, shall we say, admissions as such. This is a mainstream, shall we say, uh, journal, Trends in Cognitive Science, by an article by Peppel and William Asardi. And look what it says. We don't know how the brain stores anything, let alone words. In other words, despite all the advances in neuroscience, the massive assault on the architecture of the brain, there's no clue how experience is stored. Peppel and it's already opened by noting that there's been notable, notable progress on a couple things. The computations underline spoken and visual word recognition and the compositional processes that comprise structure building at the level of phrases and sentences. Now, I would say this is probably arguable, especially given what I would say is the fact that their entire framework is completely out of whack, at least with respect to Bergson, but I'm not going to argue that here. But things are very unclear when it comes to this. The stored elements of language, that is, words, to quote. On the other hand, we also reluctantly acknowledge recent arguments that we lack a successful story for how information is stored and what the stored information is to begin with. The problematic issue of storage has been raised in publications by Galistel and Amplified by Visada, but is rarely addressed head on in the primary literature which is an interesting statement. Head out in the primary literature. Yep, my articles are usually not in the primary literature, but I'm kind of thinking this is starting to be an ex excuse for a failure of scholarship. When one wonders why these other journals uh, exist, if you only read the primary literature, what, what good are they? In any case, this is the real kicker in this short two-page article. The core idea that drives much of the research is some form of the associationist dogma, as Galistel argues, the unbreakable embrace of Locke's theory by neuroscientists, so they're holding on real tight to Locke's associationistic theory, explains why we have still not discovered the physical basis of memory, despite more than a century of efforts by many leading figures. Researchers searching for the physical basis of memory are looking for the wrong thing, the associative bond in the wrong place, the synaptic junction, guided by an erroneous conception of what memory is and the role it plays in computation. This is the hole we have dug for ourselves. An interesting statement. Now, I, I did go look at the Galisto argument, and unfortunately, he just too goes off into the computational weeds. So it's not all that great an insight, but nevertheless, to move on. Their recommendations 
To tackle this issue, it is necessary to acknowledge and formalize the distinction between words and concepts. There are many demonstrations that words and concepts are not coextensive. Consider the global aphasia, uh, consider global aphasia or pre-linguistic infant cognition, including homonymy, 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 the one to many mapping of form to meaning, for example, bank versus bank, various kind of, various meanings of bank, bat versus bat. In other words, you know, the uh, the bat that flies around versus the baseball bat example. And synonymy, the many to one mapping of form to meaning. For example, couch and sofa, bachelor, unmarried adult male. So there's some understanding of this. The problem of storage applies obviously to concepts just as much as to words. So both words and concepts are a problem. So we don't know how words are stored or concepts are stored. This is, this is going to be a problem. More on the approach. They say, so what does it mean to be a word? On the view we advocate, words are a conjunction of form and concept. So they mean the visual or auditory form of a word. When I say coffee, that's an auditory form. And so, accepting that forms, which, we can, be, which can be speech, letters, signs, or even braille, and concepts are independently encoded and represented, three, three requirements are clear. Number one, connections need to be established between forms and concepts. And associations, warts and all, might do the necessary work to establish arbitrary links. So, sort of falling back to the hated associationism, forms need to be permanently stored. So that form, coffee, the auditory form, needs to be permanently stored. It's going to be important out down the road. And concepts also need to be permanently stored. So storing forms, concepts, their associations, which we noted they revert back to. But there's no real clue, they say. It is our view that how and in what physical engram manner the particular information is stored Friends, the information we ultimately call the representation of forms and concepts, unfriends, is simply unknown. Our understanding, in particular concerning neuroorganization, is somewhere between unsatisfactory and incoherent. They outline with little enthusiasm, I would say, three approaches. Look at computer engineering concepts. Neural net linking of all this stuff together. They're very doubtful about this, despite all of the massive variance and complexities of neural nets. Animal models. They're in big trouble. Let's take a look. So they are unbelievably far from understanding the problem here. Take our favorite concept, stirring coffee. Nice coffee stirring. Remember it has that invariant structure, velocity flow fields, an adiabatic ratio, the energy of oscillation to the frequency of oscillation, inertial tensor, with the momenta of inertia involving the stirring spoon, a haptic flow field, the acoustical invariance on the clinking, etc., texture gradients, ratios, and flows. All these invariants are defined existing only over a continuous flow of time. They don't exist in a static instant. This is just the event. It cannot be stored this event as a series of states, else you're assuming a consciousness that supports this continuity of flow. A series of states does not give you a continuity of flow. One state comes and disappears as the next arrives. You never have more than one state in a computer modern reality. But the concept, this is a higher order invariance taken across multiple experiences of coffee stirring, as we've noted. So a concept, just to make it a simple case, that external event, the stirring coffee, the invariant structure is, is being pro, uh, resonating to, shall we say, in the brain, and that sends a wave, a resonant wave, through 4D experience, because we're talking a 4D model in the Bergsonian framework. So we're sending a wave through the experience. The invariants of the coffee streams are going to stand out. That's going to be the concept. The variants wash out, so to speak. So that's a very schematic basis for what a concept actually is, given our entire experience is stored in the four-dimensionality of being. 
So the experience is our 4D being, it's an entirety. Any anomalous stirring doesn't resonate with the whole mass. For example, here's a nice anomalous stirring. It's, something's wrong with that stirring. Each anomaly actually brings out various dimensions of the event that have to be there for the anomaly to take. For example, one that, that, that dimension, we just don't normally see bubbles. The surface is smooth. But then again, we don't see the, the coffee rising an inch over the cup either. Or we don't necessarily see it smiling at us. This is to say that the event is stored in that 4D memory in total detail. You have to have this total detail of storage to account for the phenomena. So takeaways. They're extremely far from this Ricksonian framework. That's obvious. There is yet zero consideration of the problem of time or recognizing the time extended dynamics of events. Peppel and Itzardi still entertain the use of neural nets, but neural nets with their discrete states have no way to capture invariant structures over a true continuity or indivisible flow of time. And a density of states doesn't get it. No matter how dense the series of states, there's always only one state. The present state, the preceding state is gone. Computer architectures, same problem, equivalent. And remember, a connectionist network is laboriously, via weight adjustments, associating elements of the event. There is no principled method for defining these elements. So in that schematic little network I'm showing for coffee stirring, the coffee stirring elicits, elicits the relation has, and then several elements involving coffee stirring have been learned, clinking, spoon, spoon involves swirling, resistance. But as I said, there's no principal method for defining these, these are simply hatched up. In reality, the elements are all organically part of the event. They can't be separated. They are already naturally associated. They must be disassociated, differentiated. Just think of the physics. How would you separate the liquid's resistance there from the force driven by the spoon? Integral to this force being the spoon's shape, the flatness, or the flow field from the spoon's, the radial flow field of the spoon's circular motion. It's all integrally part of the physics. It makes no sense to try to be associating them. More strange, remember this, this quote. It is our view that how and in what physical dash friends engram manner, the particular information is stored that is the information we ultimately call the representation of forms and concepts is simply unknown. But here, they will not register the lessons of Lashley. Trying to prove that n-gram exists, the entire notion of the n-gram was destroyed by Dr. Lashley. He could not destroy a learned behavior. He could not find anywhere where it resided. He sliced the networks, he sliced the brain, sliced it, diced it, cut it, threw chunks away, everything he could do to try to find where this engram might be, but it was utterly unsuccessful. But no current neural net could withstand the slicing, dicing, and just plain throwing chunks of the brain away inflicted by Lashley. So we want to store words as well, just leaving concepts behind. Well, Brixen had something to say about this quest. First, setting the context, we understand a sentence spoken to us. He said, in the particular case we are considering, the object is an interlocutor whose ideas develop within his consciousness, so a speaker, into auditory representations which are materialized into uttered words. So if we are right, the hearer places himself at once in the midst of the corresponding ideas and then develops them into acoustic memories which go out to overlie the crude signs perceived, crude sounds perceived, while fitting themselves into the motor diagram. So the motor diagram was in Bergson's analysis, and it was a, it was the uh, harbinger of the motor theory of, of uh, speech perception. Shall we call it the articulatory pattern of the uh, vocal tract for creating the sounds? So if we pictured it, the speaker 
is issuing a, a phonetic frequency stream, that's all you've got to analyze. Uh, and that we get, but since the uh, if you put yourself symmetrically, so to speak, with the, the idea that you think that the speaker is expressing, talking about coffee stirring, well, then the man stirred the coffee with a spoon, the sentence can become clear in, this, in terms of individual words, that is individual word images, all of which comprise an organic sentence. So he says, to follow another speech is to reconstruct intelligently, starting from the ideas, the continuity of sound, which the ear perceives, that phonetic frequency stream. The mind having selected the point exactly symmetrical with there, that is the perceived sounds, more or less immediate cause, that being the articulatory action of the uh, secret vocal tract, allows to flow towards them the memories that will go out and overlie them. Now note, again, that number 31, we went into this in detail on uh, language understanding. But the problem, such, however, is certainly not the usual way of looking at the matter. The associationist habit is there, exactly what Peppel and Itzardi are talking about. The perception of the sound in this framework brings back the memory of the sound, and memories bring back the corresponding ideas. So the standard view, you've got that acoustic stream, which I could have represented as that frequency stream, is broken up into um, vowels, consonants, syllables, which go fetch the auditory images, the, the man stirred the coffee. And ultimately then this is all put together to create the idea of the man stirring coffee, which, is, which the uh, uh, sentence is expressing, that is the meaning. So that's the standard view. Bergson's direction is, the opposite, or we should say a combination of the two. There's, yes, there's some, there's some contribution from the downward flow, but the primary contribution is from the opposite flow, symmetrically placing yourself in the idea and then allowing memory images to make the sound, the sound pattern distinct. So continuing with respect to the associationist, associationist approach, Quote, we find men maintaining that by mere contiguity, the perception of the sound brings back the memory of the sound, and memories bring back the corresponding ideas, as we just talked about. After noting word losses via cerebral lesions, he says, the psychological observations and the clinical facts seem to conspire. Together, they seem to point to the existence within the cortex of auditory memories, slumbering whether as physical, chemical modification of certain cells or under some other form. So in other words, we're thinking the fact that um, words seem to be destroyed by cerebral lesions, and then you take the whole associationist view, well, that tends to look like the words are stored. The auditory images of words like coffee is stored in the brain. A, summary, a sensory stimulation is then supposed to awaken them. Finally, by an intracerebral process, they are supposed to evoke ideas at, at standard view in the downward direction, but not so fast. Now consider the strange consequences of this idea. The auditory image of a word is not an object with well-defined outlines, for the same word pronounced by different voices or by the same voice on different notes gives a different sound. So if you adopt the hypothesis of which we have been speaking, you must assume there are as many auditory images of the same word as there are pitches of sound and qualities of voice, not to mention for every speaker. Do you mean all these images are treasured up in the brain? Continuing, or is it the brain that chooses? If the brain chooses, where does its preference come from? Suppose that you explain where the brain chooses one or the other of the thousands of variants of the word coffee. How is it that the same word uttered by the, a new person gives a sound, which although different is still able to rejoin the same memory? For you must bear in mind that this memory is supposed to be an inert, passive thing, 
In other words, remember, it's just a suitcase. There's stuff stored inside. You speak of an auditory image of a word, as if it were an entity or a genus. Such a genus can indeed be constructed by an active memory, which extracts the resemblance of several complex sounds and only retains, as it were, their common diagram. But there is something still more perplexing. A word has individuality for us, only from the moment that we've been taught to abstract it. That is, again, we bring back in that acoustic stream and we've got to extract a word from that stream. And it doesn't start out abstracted. What we first hear, he says, are short phrases, not words. A word is always continuous with other words which accompany it and takes different aspects according to the cadence and movement of the sentences in which it is set. How could there be a point of contact between the dry, inner, isolated image and the living reality of the word organized with the rest of the phrase? Now let's take time out for one second. Something here jars jars the modern current mind. Why is Briggson going on and on about images, auditory images? I submit it's this, the dominant view of mind, the deep neural network, or this same difference, the, the computer model in which we can implement a deep neural network. In other words, somewhere in here are words, but clearly our imagination fails us if we think there's images of words, like coffee sitting there. So our dominant current conception of mind sort of jars us with respect to Bergson's discussion. But we started with concepts, which also have to be stored. So how is this stored in this? Same problem. Answer, cognitive science, AI, neuroscience have not one clue, because it's called, wait for it, the hard problem. And words are auditory images just like we're looking at the visual image and the kinesthetic image of the coffee store. It's the same problem. Remember, as we talked in number 31, AI with its series, GPT-3s, Google Chat, completely, totally abandoned trying to replicate how humans understand language. They are doing nothing remotely similar. The issue is here is how does the human understand language? And that is a complete blank to them. Bergson continues, noting multiple clinical phenomena with respect to aphasias, amnesias, lesions to the brain, which in fact utterly fail to correspond to the storage of individual words. We'll just take one example, which he discusses Rebo's law. Rebo's law says entire word classes are lost in a certain order, not just individual words, but entire classes. Proper nouns go first, like Sam, Jill, Mike, Steve, then nouns, though. Class of nouns, spoon, coffee, cup, desk, paintbrush, and then verbs, stirring, mixing. So entire classes of words are lost in a certain order, but there's a relationship here to bodily action. Note, the body's ability to easily assume a motor attitude reaction. For example, it's very easy to imitate stirring. Notice verbs, simple, easy actions working up to the bottom. And the object, well, an object like a spoon is a nexus of actions. Like you, you can stir with it, you can lift it, you can put it in your mouth, etc. But the spoon itself is just not simply imitable. The person, way more complex nexus of actions, so we say in context. Here's Bergson's quote on it. Verbs in general, which essentially express imitable actions, are precisely the words that a bodily effort might enable us to recapture. Proper nouns, on the other hand, being of all words the most remote from those impersonal actions that the body can sketch out, are those which the weakening of the function will earlier affect. Oh, by the way, did I mention the destroyed words, supposedly by the cerebral lesion, also re will return in the reverse order, the easiest first, then the next artist, and the next artist. So, in other words, in the ability to redintegrate an entire set of experience, when you're taking a certain motor attitude, you're stirring, you're starting to create that, you're creating a resonance wave that cuts through that set of experiences, shall we say. It's, it's passed through that set, that set of experiences. And bring, but all those experiences have 
the words, not all, but oftentimes they have the word stirring accompanying these things. So the, the word is going to be part of the experiences because the word is an integral part of the experience, which, which in fact, while we're at it, let's just go to the third uh, Pippel and Itzardi topic. We saw that they said they ended up still thinking they needed association to tie stored words to stored concepts. But we've just said, we integrate the experience, coffee stirring, and along comes the words. Why? Because the words, the acoustic accompaniment, are an integral part of the experience. Again, they don't have to be associated with the experience, but rather differentiated. Briggs had noted, we start with hearing phrases. The child dwells in an environment of commands. Johnny, pick up the spoon. Susie, eat the cereal. Mary, wash your hands. I noted uh, elsewhere J.J. Asher's experiments, where he did a whole series of experiments on learning second languages, modeling the learning process on first language learning. That is, you learn by responding to a series of linguistic commands, like tie your shoes and imagine this in Japanese or break the pencil or grab the spoon. That is, you're tying the language learning to motor action. But why is, why is that effective? Because the words are part of the experience and you're reintegrating the experience via creating these actions. And you can reintegrate that experience simply by reissue, issuing or starting to imitate the action of breaking or tying or grabbing. So, no, the link has nothing to do with that link with associating elements. So, a last thing from Bergson. He says, but how could it be otherwise? To hear some theorist discourse on sensory aphasia, we might imagine they had never considered with any care the structure of a sentence. They argue as if a sentence is composed of nouns, which call up images of things. So we say, man, stir a coffee spoon. Man gets in, goes and fetches an image. Stirring does, fetches an image. Coffee fetches an image. Spoon fetches an image. What becomes, he says, of those parts of speech are the precise function to establish between images relations and shades of meaning of every kind. Like with the spoon, stir the coffee with the spoon. Consider the host of different relations that can be expressed by the same word. Now, he knows an argument would be, well, this only applies to evolved languages where they have all these uh, relationship uh, words. But he says, but the more primitive the language, the more you are bound to allow for the mind's activity. Since you compel me to find out the relations, which amounts to saying that you abandon more and more the hypothesis that each verbal image goes up and fetches down its corresponding idea. Sathi says, speech can only indicate by a few guideposts placed here and there the chief stages in the movement, the indivisible movement of thought. So he says, this is why I can understand your speech. If I start from a thought analogous to your own and follow its windings by the age of aid of verbal images. So we erase that picture and we start from a thought analogous to the the, the guy thinking about coffee stirring. We kind of know the context. From that, we project auditory images from the idea over the acoustic stream. But I shall never be able to understand if I start from the verbal images themselves, because between two consecutive verbal images, there is a gulf which no amount of concrete representations can fill. Go back to that previous picture of the separate images. How, you, you haven't got the coffee stirring idea. The man stirred the coffee with the spoon. You've got a series of separate images. For he says, images can never be anything but things, and thought is a movement. Which is saying, along with all the other problems we've reviewed, that the process of understanding language itself eliminates any notion of, quote, stored words, unquote, being, quote, activated, unquote, and linked, unquote, to stored concepts and will allow we understand the sentence. That is, the entire notion of stored words is useless when we examine the nature of linguistic comprehension. So, postscript, the juggernaut. 
Computational neuroscience is an absolute juggernaut. It's just rolling along. I fear that the heavy educational emphasis on exotic mathematics and the complexity of neural nets, and there's just enormous numbers of neural nets, ever more forms are ever more complex with ever more complex mathematics, which I think just would overwhelm the uh, average mind just mastering it all. But that leaves these folks a bit crippled. And I watch a Twitter feed of neuroscience and uh, it's the, the results flowing by the papers are just mind boggling in terms of volume. There just seems though an inadequate grasp of the matrix of constraints that must be applied to any theory of language understanding from the realms of other literature, for example, the clinical, phages, amnesia, et cetera, linguistic, cognitive development, more philosophy. But we might know it here in favor or just giving uh, it's already in Peppel uh, due course here. It's already is in linguistics and Peppel's in psychology and both are in neuroscience. So from the initial comments we saw, noting uh, global aphasia problems, synonymy problems, etc. I suspect they could have developed, delved much more deeply than the just two pages that allowed in, as far as the problems go. But they have already a, a certain background, linguistics, psychology. Something, however, without this range of study seems to be missing. This approach, the associationistic approach, should have been outgrown long ago. But the juggernaut shows no sign of stopping. So next time we'll see. Until then, signing off.